my ecology is better than your ecology. So my ecology, most people don't even know that that is actually the study of fungi. So that's why we like my ecology and your ecology. I'm a microbiologist. I trained at UWA many years ago, and I've always had an interest in fungi. And I was the community officer for the Perth Urban Bushland Fungi Project, which got me into fungi education, which I really enjoy doing. And so I do talks. And as Sophie mentioned, I'm currently the Fungi Map President. Lawton, over to you. Hi. Um, I was a cook who got bored, so I went to university to study bats and realised I didn't find them very interesting um, outside of, you know, the cave. Um, so I took an algology mycology unit trying to work out what I'd do next. Uh, <laughs> the next year I was the junior tutor for that unit and the year after that I was the senior tutor um, and somehow I ended up doing a PhD. So I love fungi. I'm amazed by the diversity of them and how ubiquitous they are and how little people notice them. Um, but as we say on our first slide, they are addictive. Once you have that ability to see them, you will never lose it. Um, you will see them everywhere. So yeah, proceed at your own risk. Shall we start? Ron? Yes, let's go. Okay, um, so as you can see, uh, photos of me and Ron out in our natural tap collecting fungi. Uh, and a jar of chocolate fungi that I was given several years ago. I still got the jar, but you know, fungi disappeared. <laughs> so, um, kingdom fungi. Fungi are different to plants. They're not plants. They're actually more closely related to animals. They can't produce their own food. They actually secrete enzymes outside themselves into the environment and then reabsorb the products into themselves. They have chitin in their cell walls, which is the same material that you find in insects and crabs and shellfish. Uh, they are made up of hyphae and they have spores, not seeds. So the reproductive elements don't contain a carbohydrate reserve. And they're not mobile. So they have some relatives like the one behind me that are studied by mycologists because nobody else takes them on and they are a little bit mobile. Classification within the fungal kingdom. Traditionally, like all taxonomy, we organise things by similarity. Um, we still do that. So I've got uh, two different sorts of Romeria on this slide. So the yellow one and the lovely pink one. These are both Perth uh, species. And um, we would look at their field traits, describe how they grow, what sort of features we can see, probably look at their microscopic traits. And then we'd look at their DNA, which is now rearranging everything. Taxonomy across the world and particularly in fungi is in a state of flux. Um, several years ago, Ros and I were aware of uh, what was essentially um, an executive level tantrum by the then coordinator of the fungal collections at the West Australian Herbarium because the fungi collections are stored in huge collection of boxes and they move them all around whenever there's a change in the taxonomy. Usually that's just a little bit of shifting. Then DNA came in and all of a sudden everything was being rearranged all the time. And so there was never any order. Most of the boxes were actually out on the floor, new paper would be published and then they have to start rearranging before they'd even got the last one settled. So um, our friend Karina, through a massive tandy, announced that from here on in, um, fungal boxes were going to be arranged alphabetically. And when things settled down, uh, then they would go back to being arranged by their phylogeny. They're still arranged alphabetically. <laughs> and Karina is herself a mycologist, she loves fungi. She just wasn't too fond of rearranging them all the time. So we still use those field traits. Uh, especially at the beginning, because that's what we're working with initially. Um, but we're aware that the other underlying structures of the taxonomy and the phylogenies are changing quite frequently. Ross? Well, one thing that doesn't change is the roles that fungi play in the environment. So you can be sure that when you learn about the different things that they do, that that is one thing that stays constant. So we really have three different roles that fungi play in the environment. And it's good for you to understand and know that because it helps when you locate them and you can work out 
it helps you to work out what they are. So we call them mates, rotters and killers because those are words that you can easily remember. Mates, M for mycorrhizal fungi. So mycorrhizal means fungus root. And these are fungi that actually share nutrients with the roots of the trees. So we won't go much into that in this talk about um, beginner's ID workshop, but that is something that you will want to follow up and learn a lot about because that's really interesting. Then the rotters are the original recyclers. They've been recycling since the year dot. So that, that makes nutrients available again to be used in the world. So that's why we have a closed system that works because the fungi recycle things. And then we do have pathogenic fungi, the killers, those that can cause death. They don't always cause death, but they are certainly capable of doing it. So if you just remember, those are the three major roles that fungi play in the environment. So if you're going out to collect your fungi or document your fungi, uh, you'll need a field kit. Uh, this is my field kit. Uh, I took this photo in my kitchen yesterday while standing on a ladder, much to the amusement of my daughter. So you can see my license or permit. Now we looked into all the different states, regions across Australia and realized that licensing and permits are very, very different. So please find out what you need for your area. Um, usually a license is from the state regulator or region regulator and permit is from a governing body. So it might be for a local national park. Um, wax lunch wrap, strangely enough, impossible to get in WA. I get it brought in by a friend who has family in Canada, but it's good for wrapping your fungus in and keeps them watertight without smothering them. Notebook and pencil, a carry bag, and that's a separate one. You'll put your collected fungi in there so they don't get crushed. A field lens is pretty much the only specialist piece of equipment and you can buy them online. The one I've got, as you can see, has a, a neck strap and it has a detachable bit. It's invaluable. I lost so many field lenses by lending them to people on forays and then they just wear them home and they're so useful that they just don't remember to give them back. Uh, a cheese knife, a garden trowel for digging things out, tags for labelling, and this should go into your photographs as soon as possible if you're collecting, because you want to be able to keep an eye on which photos belong to which specimen. Um, soft brushes, Ros and I both <laughs> use um, shaving brushes, but they've got to have natural bristles, they're more delicate. And you'll see that my pastry brush is labelled fungi because I am an ex-cook. I don't want to mix up my fieldwork gear with my kitchen gear. Uh, Ros and I disagree on the best mirror to use. Ros prefers the little hand compact ones. And I like the mechanics mirrors because they've got a long extendable handle. And you can then see all the different parts of the mushroom without having to get down on your knees or bend or anything. Um, and an umbrella, and that, that's not to protect you, it's to shield the fungus from the sunlight while you take excellent photos. Ah, um, cheese knives. Now, I collect mainly in the urban area, so I will do a lot of collecting in areas that have got small children, elderly people, vulnerable members of the community. Uh, if I'm carrying a sharp hunting knife or a pocket knife, our lovely friends in blue are going to want to have a word with me. So I found that the compromise is a cheese knife. They're cheap. I actually collect them in op shops and things. The pointed fork tip is brilliant for raking. And um, plus, you know, if you spot some brie, you're already prepared. Um, <laughs> so I really like them. I do carry sharper knives, but I don't carry them visibly. And I certainly don't wave them around when there are any children. Ah. <laughs> Roz. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so like we said, umbrellas are really important for um, giving you a uniform light and for sheltering the fungus, but you can use, find them useful for yourself as well. So we always take them. <laughs> now, one of the best ways to get your eye in is to get you go with other people on a fungi foray. So wherever you live, um, look out for any signs the time of the year when fungi are around for you. Now, we're having a quest to game competition at the moment, and we in Western Australia have discovered that everybody else has got lots of fungi when we have nothing. So it's important for your local area to find out when your local fungi season is on and the people who do it, and they're usually very happy to take you out and show you what to look for because that's the way to get your eye in. But do expect to get wet. 
address to the conditions because certainly it may be warm in far north Queensland, but in southwest Western Australia, you can get quite cold because we don't move very fast and we're always stopping and looking at things. So local conditions is what you need to dress for. Now, when you're learning to identify fungi, observation. Observation, observation, observation is the most important thing. So you really need to look at things. So you just start by not touching anything. You basically just have a look at it. Now, if it's only the top of the fungus is just poking a little bit out of the ground, that's when you use your cheese knife and scruffle around and basically carefully jig out without touching the fungus. So you need to get out enough of it so that you can photograph the top, the underneath and from the side. And sometimes it's actually important to dig out the fungus and have a look at it. But if it's not important to do so, then we don't do so. So, and we'll talk to you a bit more about that during this talk. So you want to see, does your fungus have gills? Does it have pores? Does it have teeth? Or does it have some other sorts of structures? There are some very weird fungi around with different funny sorts of things. So they can even have folds underneath. So whatever you find, it's quite likely to be valid. And do also be warned that we do find things sometimes that we're going, hmm, I really wonder what sort of fungus that is. You know, that really does look a bit odd. So we have things like burnt as golf ballers and, you know, <laughs> uh, melted as plastic glovis. So, right. So, if you think it might be a fungus, then certainly have a look because um, sometimes, sometimes they are and sometimes they're not. <laughs> yes, I once um, admittedly coming home after a very long day doing field work and it was dusk, approaching dark, saw an amazing black and white fungus. And I was, you know, getting closer and closer and getting very excited when upon it um, crowed at me and flew off. <laughs> it was a magpie. <laughs> yes. <laughs> So physical traits. So as I said, this is still where we would start. All this information feeds into anything to, that you do later on. So we want to have a look at the substrate. What is our fungus growing on? And the ecology, what's it growing with? If it's growing on soil, it is probably forming a relationship with the plants around it. So we need that information too. And there are some species that grow only with certain plants and in general, Species or fungi that grow in association with um, plants and other life forms tend to be more localised because they need that partner. If you grow on dead wood, you can find dead wood anywhere. If you grow on dung, unless it's, I don't know if you have a peculiar predilection for only wombat dung, you can find that anywhere. So you're more likely to have a very broad distribution. Then we would look at the macroscopic features. So these three fungi are... Um, we've got two growing in soil, so this one here, Cortinarius archeri, and then we've got Inosibi violacorlis down here. Cortinarius archeri is actually quite large, the other one is quite small, and um, being a Cortinarius, it will have a like a spider webby ring between the edge of the cap and the stalk, or what we call the stipe. And you can see around here, this is the remnants of that spider web ring, and it's got lots and lots of brown spores attached to it, which is why it's this sort of caramelly brown color. Um, this one's tiny and the color isn't as strong and it will fade even more as the mushroom grows. And um, this one here, also purple, is uh, Gymnopolis purpulus, and it actually is growing on wood. And it's can be quite large and it's quite lovely, but they, they all have different traits and different features. There are a lot of Australian fungi or fungi in general that you can't separate down much beyond genus level uh, without looking at the microscopic features, but you can still get pretty close and there are a lot where you can go, oh, I know what that is. Now, all of these features and traits shift in importance depending on what you're looking for. Uh, what you find, and also just where the current knowledge is, depending on the group of fungi that you're looking at. I think this is you, Ros. <laughs> yes, it is. So the importance of the substrates, we can't overemphasize because your picture should show you what the substrate is. Never take your fungus out and just show it to us on a board or on a um, a plate or something like that, because we just Somebody's lose had. so much. <laughs> Uh, yeah, or in someone's hand because we lose so much of the information that's really important. So grass soil is a well-recognised habitat, local parks, 
in amongst the grass is a very well-known habitat. So sometimes disparagingly called the, the lawns and gardens fungi, but they're doing their job nevertheless, and they're a good one to start learning on. Um, a lot of things grow on dead sticks, dead lumps of wood, dead um, stumps, which is why in the bushland it's actually really important not to clean up too much, because if you clean up that, you're removing the food for a whole pile of different fungi. And as Lawton, if you want to put the thing on the um, dung fungus, yes, that, that lovely little buttons that are found, that's kangaroo dung, and the little buttons like pepper pots are found on there. And fungi can even grow on other fungi. So they can be parasitic on other fungi. So that's a well-recognized thing. So these are things that you want to learn to observe and you may well find things, oh, I didn't know that happened. Well, still observe and write it down because there's some very strange and unusual things that happen in the fungus kingdom that you might not see them very often, but you might be the lucky person who does get to see it. So this is uh, a chart with way too much information. I apologize, but there isn't really any way to make it smaller. This is the macroscopic fungi. So the bigger ones, the ones we can see with our eyes or maybe with a hand lens, but you can certainly see there's something there. And there, as you can see, there is an enormous diversity of shapes. So we have subterranean fungi, which are the truffles. Uh, Manjimup truffles are famous in Western Australia. And these, I call them the blobs. Like I take my hat off to anybody who can study these things because, well, this sort of round. Um, there are other traits, but to me, I'm just looking up and going, wow. Um, we now know from DNA work that a lot of the fungi that grow as round blobs are actually related to other fungi that are, to my mind, much more impressive. We have two major difference groups in fungi, and that is the basidia mycetes. Um, when I'm teaching, I tell my students that to imagine a cow's udder with balloons on the teats. And um, that's the typical arrangement for spore production in the basidiomycetes. And that includes things like our, our ordinary shock fungus, Agaricus bisporus. So it's unusual. Instead of two, um, four, it has two. And then we have ascomycetes. And these have, it's like a, a sock with lots of little balls inside it. And they usually have eight spores in each of one of those. And um, this is our cup fungi. Um, our morels and our very expensive truffles. Then we have the weird things. Um, we've got cage fungi, we have earth stars, puffballs, um, stalked puffballs, and then tiny little birds nests uh, named because when they open up they have like a cup and then inside they'll have little tiny pellets and that's where the spores are but they resemble eggs. Um, you name it, it's probably out there in the kingdom fungi. Corals, bracket fungi, um, as Ross said, there are things with pores, with teeth, things that look like clubs, um, candle snuff. So it looks like a snuffed candle wick, everything. I think you've got the interesting bit of this one, Ros. <laughs> I do, that's right. So some of the things that we want to look for, and this is what you will start to see when you actually go on a fungus foray and see them. There'll be different sorts of caps. There'll be caps that are like funnels, caps that are slimy, caps that are dry, caps that have got bits stuck onto them, and caps that have got lumps and warts and things like that on them. We always go for a fungus foray early in the morning, like. Because it's winter when we go in Western Australia, we basically go at about 10 o'clock in the morning. And that's when the fungi have just come up and they're fresh and you see lovely fresh fungi because even by the afternoon, they're not looking so fresh. So you really want to see these when they're there at their really best. So uh, first thing you do is look at the cap from the top and then you get your mirror or you crawl down on the ground and you look underneath and have a look at the fungus. And you'll find there are so many different things underneath the fungi, even amongst the gilled fungi. So we've got five examples here of fungi with gills and one with fungi with pores. Now pores look almost like spongy stuff underneath and te teeth are like little blunt teeth coming out from the bottom. When you see your first fungus with teeth, you go, oh my golly, look at that. So there's a lot to look at there. So it's not just does my fungus have gills or not. It's a case of how close the gills are, what colour the gills are, 
a whole range of things like that. That's why photographs are just so useful at this stage because you won't remember all of that. And where you can see Lawton showing that some of the gills will go all the way, but in some fungi, they have shorter gills and then they have tiny gills. So they vary a lot. So there's all sorts of things to look for in that case. Okay, next one. Oh, well, so um, the main features on the left-hand side that we've got with our macroscopic ex experience, um, macroscopic appearance, shows you all the different layers of the fungi. Now, one of the good things to, to note about this is when a fungus comes up out of the ground, it basically is sheltering its spores. So they often come up when it's raining, so they don't just present the spores out in the rain unless they're a bird's nest fungus, which wants the rain, but they're the mushroom-shaped fungi all basically protecting their spores. So the spores get shot out into the air current and then they float around on the air current. So that's what this one is to tell you. Next. And the last, the last one is the differences in the ring. This is the membrane that when the mushroom is developing, it goes between the edge of the cap and the stem. And as the cap expands, it tears away. Now, not all mushrooms have this. So this one here, it doesn't. You can see that the ring is clean. Oh, sorry, the stipe or stalk is clean. Whereas this one in the middle, it's got quite a nice little ring of tissue here. And this show off on the other side, it, it had a ring, but when it expanded, the ring stayed stuck to the edge of the cap. And that's what this frill is. And you can see that the rest of it is torn and sticking to the top of the stalk. Um, some fungi will have a ring when they're really young, but as they get mature, it just falls off. So unless you have um, a young specimen, you won't be able to see it. So you sort of, you have to say, I can't see one now, but remember there might have been one before. Um, so the next thing, the other things we want to look at are the stalk or the stipe. So we look for how is it shaped? Is it long? Is it thin? Is it lobby solid? And um, this one here is a bolete. So this is a type of fungus that has like a bath sponge of spores underneath it. They're quite fine. The stalk on this one is really pitted and quite decorative. And it's also very tacky. You get, if you touch this one, you know about it because you spend the rest of the day rubbing your hands trying to get the residue off. Um, then we've got something that's totally different. It's got very wide space gills. And it's got a very slender, fragile, brightly coloured um, stalk. And it changes colour. It's pinky red at the top and it goes through orange and then yellow down at the base. And the base is very, it, it doesn't, there's no bulb, it just sort of stops. Um, this is a tiny little fungus that's bright yellow. Um, and the whole fungus is fluffy. It's got like little fibres all over it including the stem. So you can see that it's the surface is fluffy. Uh, this one is actually quite a small fungus. It grows on wood and the stalk is quite clean and uniform all the way down its length. So it doesn't have a very narrow top and then a wide base or vice versa. But the surface is smooth and it's got like long striations finally all the way down it. Um, stalks are not very interesting. It's hard to come up with a lot to say about them. <laughs> the other thing we look for is the, the base of the stalk, because if you see on this diagram, we've got this cup, and that's called a vulva, and that's the remnants of the outer membrane that some mushrooms come up on. The red and white spotty mushroom that we had before, that's the fairy mushroom or the Super Mario mushroom, the white spots are actually also parts of this enveloping membrane. Uh, sometimes they wash off if you've got a lot of rain, but that plus a ring and a white spore means an ammonita, and those are the ones that can be very deadly. So we always want to check what is the base of our stalk like, so we can go, okay, is it possibly an ammonita? Uh, this one, it's bulbous, but it's clean. The mushroom doesn't have a universal veil. Now this one does, but it's hard to see unless you really know what you're looking for. And it's this little ring of tissue that sits on top of this bulb on the bottom of the mushroom. Sometimes it's very, very obvious, like in this picture, but other times it's quite subtle. 
And then you get things like this. This is a bracket fungus, but it has gills, quite fleshy and small. It doesn't really have a proper stipe. It has a sort of stumpy or residual stipe. And the whole thing is velvety and furry. That's quite sweet. Spore prints? <laughs> or am I doing spore prints? I thought you were doing, doing spore prints, I think. I am? Yes. Oh, okay. Um, so spore prints are another thing that was used for a long time to sort things into different families. So you'll see old um, taxonomy keys for deciding what you've got that will say, is the spore print pink, green? There are some fungi with green spore prints, black, brown. You can get charts that describe all the different colours. And it's still a very useful exercise. And the other thing is it gives you a collection of mature spores because anything that's shed by the fungus is at the size that it would have been released. So we know that it's grown to the maximum size. Some fungi like this one on the right, this is Umphalatus nudiformis. Um, it can be very, very big, huge fans. It glows, it glows green. You, ne you need to be somewhere without new light. Um, toilets and cupboards are good. <laughs> um, I find that my family and friends will no longer enjoy this because they're like, oh, take it away. We don't want to see it. But it does give you a very thick white spore print quite quickly. Um, the spore print itself will glow as well. Now you can get a spore print by simply you take, cut the stalk off at the level of the edge of the cap and you put it on the paper and then you cover it with something that keeps the wind and air currents away from it and then leave it for overnight. And if it, if it needs a bit longer, you know, let it sit there. If you leave it for days, and some of my students have done this, yes, you will get something on the paper, but that is called decomposition. <laughs> it smells very bad and it is not a spore print. Uh, once you've got these, we just seal them up, uh, fold the paper over and put them in an envelope. It's a good idea to note the colour of the spore print when it's fresh, because a lot of them will change colour as they dry out and age. Um, some of the really old books on field work will tell you to spray spores with hairspray or artist fixative or something. Please don't do that, because once you do that, you gum up the spores and nobody can do any work on them later on. Um, so, as you can see, this was a friend of mine and Ros, unfortunately since deceased. But Joe used to keep an extensive collection of spore prints. It was a wonderful resource. So one of the things that um, when we're teaching you to um, learn to identify fungi is that photographs are now a very, very useful way of recording and working out the identity of your fungus. But there's a few things that are really important and without these, the fungus can't be identified. So in some instances, like the orange one on the left, you can see it has no stem, but it has a top and a bottom. So one piece has been pulled off to show the bottom, whereas the top is showed in the same photo. And where possible, you want to have all the features in the same photo as much as you can. So top and bottom in that photo is what you really do want. And you also would take a habitat photo as well. Now, the one on the top at the right is our normal um, mushroomy looking fungus. So it's been dug up so you can see what sort of a base it's got. You can have a look at the stem. You can see if it's got any um, ring on it of any sort. We can't really see the top on that as well as we'd like to. So another photo with the top would be a good one as well. And the mirror in this case is used to show you that it's actually a gilled fungus. And then the one down the bottom, which is a puffball, that puffballs often have to be cut in halves. So when you do that, you actually turn one piece over so you can see what it looks like. The one on the right is what it looked like on the ground. And then the left one shows you what it's looked like cut inside. Now this one's called a pisolithus, which means pea stones, like pea rocks. And you can see the little cells, individual cells in there. Now, my husband always said that looks like Vegemite stuffed with sesame seeds, which I think is a very good description of what it looks like. So, and then there is another one that is basically uniformly um, purple inside. And sometimes from the outside, you cannot tell which one you've got until you've cut it in half. So if you want it identified, it's really important to actually cut those ones in half. Now you'll notice there's a little tiny bit of um, sort of ruler there. So that's very useful for a scale as well. Sometimes we use coins, but obviously coins only mean something to us here in Australia. So something with centimeters marked on it is very useful.
I did send a collection to America um, years ago when I was a grad student and um, all the photos had a five cent piece in them as a scale. And they, they were like, oh my God. Um, and I said, oh, I'm so sorry, and sent them a picture of a five cent piece on a ruler so they could use that as a scale. I said, could you send us a coin? Because that's lovely. <laughs> <laughs> so I did. So I've officially broken the law of Australia. I think you're getting the beautiful ones. Yes. Rose. So you can see that <laughs> a huge range in the colours and the shapes and the forms of the different fungi. So you can see the bottom right one again, we've put the mirror in so that you can actually see underneath of these ones, because these ones actually have folds underneath rather than gills. So a lot of them are strikingly beautiful, some amazing colours. Um, you wouldn't really imagine that you'd have purple fungi and bright red fungi and bright orange fungi, but we do, but the colours do not last for very long. So the beauty of having a smartphone is that when you see the fungus, you take the photo. You don't go home to get your camera because it may no longer be there. When you see it, you take its picture instantly. And then you can go home and deal with the photos that you've got, but take the photos when you get the chance to. Um, some fungi are just weird, uh, very weird. This is a cup fungi. So this one, if you look down the microscope, would have all its little spores in a stock or a flask type structure with the spores inside. I, these, I've seen these black, purple, green, I think the green was actually a black one that had worn down a little, washed out. Uh, and these, you, after fire, you'll get a whole, you can get a surface of tiny little disc fungi, they're called orange ones on the sooty black land. Um, this one, this really, really smells. The green slime you can see here is where the spores are and it mimics the smell of rotting flesh. Um, so it, it's fly dispersed. Uh, it's in the phallus section and some of them really, really look like cocks. There's just no way around it. And they all reek. Like people have had their drains inspected and it turns out it's a crop of these things sitting in the ground. Um, it's, this one is probably just about to collapse. They, they come up here as an egg, you can see it here, and then they erupt. Um, I haven't seen one for a couple of years. They used to be everywhere. They're quite often uh, in very soil, like very sandy soils, not a lot of other stuff going on. Um, so maybe that's why we're not seeing them so much at the moment. Uh, but you can find, as Ross said, the whole range of colors, you'll get everything. And some of the stuff when I was starting, I was like, uh, I'm not sure what this is, and I take it in to my mentee, and she said, "Oh, that's a this." And once or twice, she said, "I'm no, sorry, lot, and that's a, and you know, insect egg case." Or on one one glorious occasion, she said, mm, "That's caterpillar poo." But um, you learn. Um, this is <laughs> this is me being snippy with my students. Um, you don't find an otter in a tree, and you don't find a pollutus in a sand. Now there are fungi that will confuse you, they will be, a pluteus should be growing on wood. I found them where it looks like they're growing in sand, but you have a bit of a dig around and you find that they're actually growing on a piece of wood. The wood is just in the sand. So there are some mushrooms that you will find in certain areas. This is a morel, uh, they're delicious. And they come up in disturbed areas. And several, well, many years ago now, I noticed that I kept finding them on pine mulch but the pine mulch has to be on an area that's been recently disturbed. So anywhere that uh, landscaping has been going on is a great place to find a large collection of morels. Uh, Bulbitus, this is one of the lawn fungi and it's, I call it a sprinkler fungus because it'll come up in the very early morning when the sprinklers are on and then it'll be gone by midday. It's very delicate and fragile. This is another one of the ghost fungi, the glow in the dark ones. Uh, it is edible, but only for about five hours. After that, it makes you puke. Um, <laughs> if, it, if it made you puke immediately, that would be useful. We could use it if you'd eaten something truly poisonous. Um, five hours is just annoying. And this gelatinous little beastie is a tremella. And tremella are beautiful and quite creepy. They parasitize other fungi growing inside the wood and they only fruit when they've eaten enough of another fungus. So whenever you see a tremella, 
uh, you know that it's killing something and having a good time doing it. So documenting fungi, as we talked about, um, if you've got your other camera with you, that's great. But the smartphones now have such good cameras on them. And you can also add some apps like Lawton has a magnifying app on hers called, what's it magnifier. called? Yeah, magnifier. magnifier. That's pretty easy. <laughs> yes. So you don't ever need a license or permit to photograph the fungi. That is quite permissible. So yeah, that's why photographs are so much more useful now than they used to be. And try not to disturb the fungus. That's why we use mirrors as much as possible. So there are some things that you really won't be able to get the data without disturbing them, but only disturb them if you really need that. Now, in the last few years, things like Questa Game and iNaturalist have come to the fore and they are a huge help. Um, in working out what your fungi are so that you don't need to know a lot of the things that we initially learned when we were about the different families and things because you can just get help from our naturalist and that you will learn a lot through that. Yeah, I prefer um, uh, not as many as Rose, partly because I do a lot of collecting with Rose and she usually <laughs> puts them up before I can get to them. Um, but I have documented one slug. It was eating a fungus and it was so lovely and I thought I'm going to put that up there. So there it is on iNaturalist. I know nothing about slugs, but the slug experts um, got together and they ID'd it for me. So it's awesome. It's a huge resource. So collecting is the other side and that is to collect uh, fungi as with any Australian biota, you must have a license. Um, a license is usually from the overarching area and the permit is from a controlled area. So that would be uh, a national park or something, uh, in which case you will have to have both. You also need a reason. The, you can't just go, well, I just feel like collecting fungi. So get in touch with your local areas controlling either Department of Natural Resources, your state herbarium. There are so many different um, restrictions and requirements that we just couldn't go into it. You can use internet forms. A lot of people have done that very successfully. I use the old fashioned one. Um, this is, I simply have artists um, notebooks and I draw everything out, describe it. I take several photos with my smartphone. I take, I've always taken a lot of photos, but as Ros said, having all that geolocation data immediately on your collection with a little strip saying, you know, what your collection number is, it's just awesome. You, you can't lose your records now. Um, this is actually a collection I made in Scotland when I was over there for a conference. I couldn't take the spores or the collection home with me. So I, but I duplicated the um, documenting and it's now lodged in the, one of the Scottish herbariums. Um, one of the weirder and important things to note if you are collecting is what's not there. So if, you, if you're looking for something and, you, and it, you, you don't see it, so no ring noted or looked for forked hills but didn't see them, it shows that you were thinking this feature might be pertinent, but it's definitely not there. there it's, you won't do it all the time. Everybody forgets, but it's so frustrating when you look back at a collection and you can't tell, did I see this? Did I look for it? Was it there or did I just not, did I not notice it? Um, spore prints, if you're planning on lodging, if possible, make two from the same mushroom. So uh, two pieces of paper and put it over. So one half stays with your records and the other half goes to whichever the herbaria you lodge. Drawings, um, I'm not an artist and I have cried over some of my drawings, <laughs> um, but it really focuses your attention in a way that snapping off a lot of photos won't. Um, the two together is ideal. And dryers, if you're lodging your specimens and to have a license or a permit, you must lodge them eventually. Uh, the dry, dryers that you can regulate the temperature down as low as possible are the best because that will cause the least damage to the DNA. Um, and it, as I said, you, you have to lodge them eventually. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, but you can hang on to them for quite a while. I've got boxes that um, the herbarium knows that once I've done the micro microscope work on them, I'll hand them over. In fact, they're actually drowned in data, so they probably prefer that I didn't. <laughs> so 
Okay, so there are quite a number of Australian field guides now. We used to look at a lot of international field guides, but now we realise that other than the rotters, the those ones which are found sometimes all over the world, our mycorrhizal fungi are very restricted to Australia. So it's much better to look in books of Australian fungi. There are a lot of Australian fungi. We don't know what they are yet. We haven't got enough mycologists working on them. But these and Fungi Map um, Bookshop has a whole range of Australian um, fungi books as well. So having a look in books, and, and some will only be photographed in one book. So most of us have a collection of about 10 different Australian fungi books because it's great fun having a look through them and seeing all the different things that could be. And then you go, oh, that looks like it might be the one that I've got. So don't, don't hesitate to get yourself a collection of fungi books because they're very useful. And decorative. <laughs> <laughs> well... But even as Ross said, we don't know the ID. So getting down to a family, maybe as much as you can do. Uh, I'm a little suspicious of people who trot out field books where everything is ID'd because I'm like, well, wait on. I know Ros and I both know the top mycologists in Australia and they have a whole load of stuff they haven't ID'd. So how are you managing this? But getting close and learning those speeches is um, fascinating and frustrating. I know when I was starting and I, I said to Roz, but how do you know it's a Pluteus or a Lepidella or, and she go, well, you get a feel for it. And um, I was like, Arr! but she's right. And you can't teach experience. You can just help people shorten how much time they need to get there. Um, so just go with it. <laughs> and don't worry too much about getting exactly the right name. Uh, even old fungi books are quite good because the only time you'll have an issue with an out-of-date name is if someone had said, oh, we think that's actually two different names and then you don't know which one to follow. If the name has simply changed, like, um, oh, the little, the fluffy yellow stipe that I used, the, the mushroom that comes from, it's been in 14 different genera. So the poor thing is quite exhausted. But also you can follow any of those names and end up with the current one. Uh, as taxonomists, we know we'll be wrong. We're only going to be right for a very short time because some other bastard will come along and go, ah, that's not right. So guidebooks are always useful and never quite accurate. <laughs> uh, here are some useful resources though. Again, we didn't put every, well, we really just put a small selection, a fungi map obviously. Uh, the Australian National Botanic Gardens, uh, International Society for Fungal Conservation. The um, Mycology Online has some really useful resources, especially when you're starting out. Australasian Mycological Society, and then each of your own areas. You're going to have group, local groups that study different nature reserves, uh, conservation groups. Uh, naturalists and groups seek them out as Ross said you know there is going to be a lot of people who will be more than happy to have yet more loonies lying in the ground photographing things um because we we love meeting new mycologists and um, they will also help you through getting a license or permits um if you decide you'd like to collect and it's awesome fun okay now i know that all of you really want to ask which ones can I eat now we do recommend that you don't eat them so and particularly don't take ones from the bush because we really don't know what ones we've got we know too little about Australian fungi and they're very different to other parts of the world we have a um, medical paper written about a lady a Swiss lady who was in far north Queensland and she found a bolete one of the ones that you can see the photo here with paws underneath now until she ate her bolete we were fairly sure that none of our Australian bolets would kill anybody. She ate this bolet because she said it was identical to what she was used to eating in Switzerland and they were delicious. Her husband only had a mouthful. She ate all the rest of it and she ate all of it, which was absolutely shattering for the scientists. She died within eight hours. He had to have a liver transplant and he only just survived. And if you're going to eat a fungus, if you're not going to listen to what we say, then please leave half of it in the fridge with a note saying what you, you know, that you ate some of this. Because then at least if you die, we'll learn something from it. 
So we learned nothing other than we have an Australian bolete unknown that can kill people, which mm. was very frustrating. You could and document your symptoms on the way to your grave. That would be really helpful too. <laughs> but seriously, we, we, we just don't know. And it is so easy. And like even very experienced taxonomists make errors on occasions. And so the chances that you or I will identify absolutely perfectly everything that's deadly and isn't deadly is just non-existent. And you'll so, find that the mycologists themselves don't eat things. So, yeah, except for I, eat, I eat morels. Except morels, yes, because <laughs> they're so distinctly different. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So most of the time when people are uh, poisoned by fungi, in, especially in urban areas, it's not the fungus, it's either sprays because the local council has been spraying the bush or it's bacteria. Uh, so it's basically food poisoning and it's just coincidental that the way they got that into their system was on this poor mushroom. But it, it's just not a good idea. We don't know enough. Go, go um, mushroom shopping, much better. Yes, so either the supermarket or else grow your own. Quite some years you can get bunnings, um, sorry, boxes of mushrooms from your local hardware store or places like that and have the fun of growing your own mushrooms and harvesting when they're ready. That's a lovely thing to do. Some years it's very popular, some years it's not. So you can see these are the portobello mushrooms that I really enjoyed and ate one year. And then the next slide is oyster mushrooms. Now, certainly in Western Australia, you can buy these in a box and then go put them into your bathroom and grow them and have for about four weeks, you can have a constant supply of some very lovely mushrooms. So, and they come in different colors and some different flavors. Yes, Lawton? So I've seen the pink ones as well. Yes, that's yep. right. And it's great fun to grow them. Yeah. So, yeah. So if you're really keen to, you know, grow them and eat them yourself, then, there's a lot of different types that you can try and you can explore that, but please don't eat the ones from the bush. We just don't know enough about them. So, and thank you for listening to us. <laughs> that is a terrible pun. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a mycologist pun, isn't it? So, <laughs> okay. So